Hello, so hello and welcome everyone. I think we're ready to begin. Um, I would just like to first say the title of today's webinar is Open and Transparent Forest Data, Innovation and Technology for Climate Action. Um, and thank you all for joining us so far. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to hand over to Christina for a few words on the FAO eLearning Academy, who have kindly organized today's session. Over to you, Christina. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emily, and welcome everyone to this, um, to this webinar on open and transparent forest data. This is uh, one of a series of uh, international technical webinars that are being uh, jointly organized by uh, the FL eLearning Academy together with uh, the United Nations uh, Economic and Social Commission for the Pacific and Agrinium. This is um, a joint collaboration. And um, what I wanted to mention is that uh, the idea is really to try to promote the thematic areas that are covered in our over 350 multilingual e-learning courses that are uh, delivered free of charge as a global public good through the FAO e-learning academy. So I'd, I'd, I'd like to invite you after to have a look at the offerings of the FAO e-learning academy. And um, for the time being, uh, I will come back to that and I will give you also a, a series of links uh, related to forestry courses. And uh, for the time being, I would like to wish you all an excellent webinar and I give back the floor to Emily. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. Um, so today's webinar, as Christina mentioned, is the fourth in a series organized by CBIT Forest, a global project revolving around transparency, climate change and forests, on how enhancing transparency can be achieved and how achieving transparency can actually enhance our collective climate action. Um, we are going to be talking about the role of technology in enhancing transparency, taking a look at the latest innovations that are changing how we access and use data for good. Um, it's fantastic to see so many of you online. I think we're about 200 right now, um, and we're looking forward to interacting with you today. We will have six presentations, followed by a 15-minute question and answer session today, um, where we want to hear from you. Um, in total, this session will last for one hour and 30 minutes. Um, a quick word uh, for those that have just joined on the format of this Zoom. This is a webinar, so your microphones are muted. However, this session is all about interacting with you. So please don't hesitate to pose your questions in the question and answer box that you'll see at the bottom to each of our speakers as you listen to their presentations. Um, and if someone has already posed a question that interests you, you can give it a virtual thumbs up. Um, you will notice there is both a Q&A box and a chat. Um, today, my colleague Anatoly Pultohiru, who worked for FAO um, with the Bangladesh Forest uh, Department for many years, will be helping me select the most appropriate questions for our speakers. Um, and to make that easier for us and respond uh, to find and respond to those questions, we do ask you to please keep um, your questions in the Q&A box and to reserve the chat uh, for if you have any technical problems or, or general comments. Um, let me introduce myself. My name is Emily Donegan, um, and I work for the National Forest Monitoring Team at the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, and I'll be your moderator for today's session. Uh, so now that you know who I am, um, I'd love to know more about you, and I see that you, many of you already have done, and that's great. So um, please do go ahead, pop your name and affiliation into the chat box. So without further ado, I'd like to also introduce you to our first speaker, Rocio Condor from FAO. Rocio is a forestry officer leading the global project CBIT Forest, building global capacity to increase transparency in the forestry sector, coordinating activities to make forest data more transparent and accessible in the context of the enhanced transparency framework. Thanks for being with us here today, Rocio, to open the webinar. Um, over to you. Thanks, Emily. And thanks for giving me also the opportunity to provide some introductory remarks. And let me start by sharing with all of you three key messages. Forests play a central role in combating climate change. Therefore, given the significant potential of forest, improving the transparency of forest-related data and information within the enhanced transparency framework of the Paris Agreement is vital. We need stakeholders and governments who are informed by and acting with better and more transparent data. 
A fully functional multipurpose national forest monitoring systems allows countries to achieve multiple national goals as well as to track progress on climate action and effectively report on forest related emission and removals. Building a national forest monitoring system is a complex national scale effort that must consider multiple national, um, institutional, technical and financial aspects. A national forest monitoring system should increase transparency, re reliability of the information produced and ensure a long-term perspective. Ultimately, a robust national forest monitoring system will help countries to meet the requirements of the enhanced transparency framework. Building partnerships helps ensure the impact of forest monitoring support, including with intergovernmental and governmental organizations, resource partners, universities, and civil society, especially young women and men. Efforts to support forest monitoring should focus on strengthening the development of a national forest monitoring system. Innovation and technology have a fundamental role to accelerate accurate, open and transparent forest data for climate action. So how FAO is contributing to towards this effort? CBIT Forest is a two-year global project to step up developing countries' ability to collect, analyze, and disseminate forest-related data to make forest data transparent and accessible in line with the enhanced transparency framework. It aims to increase institutional and technical capacities and to boost knowledge sharing and awareness raising about the ETS, ETF, particularly in the forest sector. CBIT Forest builds on already existing efforts of the FAO to support countries on forest monitoring at global and national levels. And the upcoming speakers will elaborate more on those efforts. But how are we doing that? Organizing sub-regional and national workshops to build capacities and enhance their national forest monitoring system. 26 countries targeted, as well as 187 countries and territories included as part of the global network of national correspondents for the Global Forest Resources Assessment, FRA. Strengthening the network of key partners, such as the UNFCCC, the Global Forest Research Observation Initiative, UNEP, UNDP, the International Forest Student Association. Upgraded FAO's FRA 2020 reporting and dissemination platform to make forest data reporting easier in the future, but also accessible. Developing knowledge and training material, including the e-learning course to enable access to knowledge about the ETF and forest to anyone, anywhere. A tool developed to facilitate the assessment of gaps and needs in countries' national forest monitoring system. Outreach and sharing of case studies and best practice on transparency in the forest sector. Please let me briefly introduce key updates from the project. Our free and open e-learning course on forests and transparency under the Paris Agreement is available in three languages with digital batch certification and also in PDF printable versions. Join the 250 learners that have already downloaded the course. This e-learning course has three models which highlight the importance of the National Forest Monitoring System to meet the requirements of the transparency framework. And in the second model, you will be able to download the new National Forest Monitoring System Assessment Tool, which is available already in three languages. And today, I'm excited to share with you the third case study of forest and transparency from Bangladesh, after already being shared Costa Rica and the Democratic Republic of Congo. And I'm really happy to have Mariam with us, telling a, a bit more about this country-led process. Back to you, Emily. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Rocio, um, for that overview. You made it really clear how forest monitoring relates to climate action and flag some nice resources, which uh, Fabio will kindly put in the chat, the links to. Um, everyone remember, if you have any questions for uh, Rocio or for any of our speakers, please pop them into the Q&A box and we'll get around to them. 
Uh, so Rocio has just shared the case study on Bangladesh. And next up, we hear from Mariam Akhtar, who is the Assistant Chief Conservator of Forests in the Forest Department of Bangladesh under the Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change. Mariam is actively involved in establishing the Bangladesh Forest Information System. So we are about to hear about what open and transparent forest data means in practice. It's great to have you here today with us, Mariam, over to you. Thank you, Emily. Uh, thank you again, um, who they are at us to, with this webinar today, nationally, internationally available. All are welcome in this presentation. Uh, I will share the experiences from Bangladesh, uh, how we are developing data here and how we are going to share with those data with the forestry sector stakeholders through the Bangladesh Forest Information System. Bangladesh Forest Department, uh, so some of the background I will share with the department and then I will go through the presentation de in detail. Forest Department maintains nearly 10,000 staffs and manages 14.1% of the forest area in the country and which actually needs the information system for manage and because of the forest resources. So we have previous experiences for developing the information system and we develop many of the information systems and uh, under different projects, but most of them, uh, maybe all of them are not operational, operational right at this moment because there were a very limited skill, IT skill and facilities uh, with the forest department and several other challenges like uh, there were, were very few technical staffs to handle those information systems. At the same time, they were not centralized so most, mostly. And uh, also the proper documentation we did not find. So the, with that, we learned from these previous inf information systems and we started developing the information system called Bangladesh Forest Information Systems, which is first web-based information system of forest department under the Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change to manage the forest and conservation. The BFIS is mainly supporting us for planning, implementation and monitoring of multi-objective forest management activities. Bangladesh Forest Information System is a dynamic web-based platform to support the monitoring and management, support the innovation in research, education, and forestry. It provides access to consistent document and forest-related information. It's for sharing, accessing, and managing databases from centralized and integrated based platforms. The Bangladesh Forest Information System supports implementation uh, of actually the government's Digital Bangladesh Vision 21, its Rights to Information Act, Sustainable Development Goals, eight five-year plans, country investment plans, and many more. This also supporting us to prepare the consistent reporting for the national and international purposes, and we are sharing it at different levels. There were uh, many of the stakeholders involved in the BFIS, Bangladesh Forest Information System Development. As I said, I mentioned that uh, the adequate uh, IT facilities and skill is not available at Forest Department. Forest Department did a service level agreement with the Bangladesh Computer Council and uh, for hosting the server in their servers and for the maintenance of the information system by the Computer Council. And Bangladesh Forest Department builds its capacity and responsible for maintenance and access control and updating the contents in the BFIS and targeted beneficiaries like the stakeholders, they can collect related information and data from the BFIS. And targeted user, like in the forest department, they are uh, in different level, they should review and they are doing the review, editing and input updates the information, depending on the level of accessibility. Depending on the available information, we started developing the modules in BFIS 
several modules you can see in the green colors. They are developed and they are currently operational in the BFIS and several other uh, database is under development uh, through module. And some of the uh, nationally developed modules we are hosted in BFIS as because we wanted to get them in one platform. And there uh, are several modules I mentioned. I want to share with you some of the modules, how they are working and what is inside of the modules. Like first module is Bangladesh Forest Inventory. This module uh, contains the databases, reports, raw data, and supporting documents are available in this module. And through this tool, the stakeholders can download the related databases and reports uh, from this module. The next module is GeoPortal, which is uh, supporting us to monitor the forests, uh, the uh, land cover maps we developed using the remote sensing images uh, are hosted in this module. And this uh, GeoPortal is interoperable with, with GeoNode based platforms for interacting and sharing this data. And this platform uh, it allows user to analyze, create, share, and visualize geospatial data and maps without using the mapping software. So it is easy to create their own data for downloading. And BFIS module forest emission factor database, it, is, uh, it consists several of the databases like allometric equation, wood densities, raw data, emission factors, they are available in this module, the country specific elementary equations, density data, emission factors can be used for the calculation of biomass for trees and forests. So there are a huge database kind of 700 country specific elementary equations are available there. So 200 wood density data and emission factors is available there. So this is supporting us really to calculate accurate biomass for our forest and trees. Tree species identification module is uh, supporting us in the field when we are going for the inventory, field inventory, to identify the tree species in the field. And site-specific planning, this is a recently developed module, is hosted in BFIS. This is a really unique tool. This is identifying the uh, field level interventions, uh, field level data for interventions, actually for a uh, forest beat landscape level. Beat is the lowest administrative unit of forest department for uh, to restore the denoted and degraded forest as well as to increase the forest cover. And this tool really help us uh, for developing the baseline uh, for future monitoring, uh, monitoring the management performances. So this is really using the land cover maps and Google Earth together to develop the, to identify the interventions in different uh, at lowest administrative level of forest department. E-library is uh, hosting the manuals, reports, books, uh, scientific papers, uh, and many more. All the uh, digital uh, digitalized document, important documents we are hosting in this library and which is very easy for downloading. So forestry sector stakeholders together, they're really getting all the informations uh, in this library. So I already came to the conclusion is that the Bangladesh forest information system is really helping forest department to monitor the forest and uh, planning uh, in preparation and prepare the plans and, uh, get, and identifying the interventions. So uh, technological progress is really helping forest department to manage a large amount of data for different audiences. And it's easy to download and uh, then the forestry sector stakeholders is really, really getting the consistent information so far nowadays through this Bangladesh forest information system. And this system is interoperable so it is easy for everybody uh, to download. And this Bangladesh information system is really helping the forest department to identify the interventions to address the climate change issues, as well as management and conservation of the forest. 
Thank you very much. I will want to get back to you, Emily. Thank you so much, Maria Mappa, for describing the platform, the BFIS that Bangladesh has in place to store and manage forest data and make it easier to share among stakeholders. Um, we will turn now to Ansi Pekarinen to learn more about another data platform, that of the Global Forest Resources Assessment, or FRA, just highlighted by, highlighted by Rocio in her introductory remarks. Um, this platform represents a new way of accessing FRA's global forest data and was launched just this July. ANSI is Senior Forestry Officer at FAO and Team Leader of the Global Forest Resources Assessment. Over to you, ANSI. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. Can you hear me well? Yes. Good morning, afternoon and evening, everyone, depending on your whereabouts. Uh, my name is ANSI and I'm coordinating the Global Forest Resources Assessment at the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. It's a great pleasure to be with you here today. My today's brief presentation on the Global Forest Resources Assessment 2020 will focus on the ways in which we have tried to make this uh, information uh, more transparent and accessible to the global community. But let me start with a little bit of background. The Global Forest Resources Assessment is a process coordinated by FAO, where official country statistics on forest resources, their management and latest assessment, FRA 2020 as we call it, covers more than 60 broad variable categories and all 236 countries and territories of the world. The data were collected through a global network of officially nominated national correspondents that currently covers 187 countries and territories. Sorry, Ansi, we are not seeing your presentation. Can you please share your screen again? Thank you. Can you see it now? Yes, thank you so much. Okay. To reduce the overall reporting burden, the FAO collects these data in close collaboration with other partners, United Nations Economic Commission for Europe, Forest Europe, Montreal Process, Central African Forest Commission, known as COMIFAC, and the International Tropical Timber Organization, ITTO. This is done through a common reporting process, the Collaborative Forest Resources Questionnaire. The results of FRA 2020 have been published in a number of different products. In May, we published the key findings, which are available as a PDF document and also as an interactive digital report. The latter is available in all six official UN languages. In addition, in July, we published a comprehensive main report, which describes the whole FRA 2020 process and its results. At the same time, we made the individual PDF reports for all 236 countries and territories available online. Finally, all the data reported to FAO by the countries and territories were published on an open access and easy to use FRA platform at fra-data.fao.org. And this is where our focus will be today. Now, let me guide you through the main functionalities of this platform. The first thing you will see when accessing the fra-data.fao.org link is this, our landing page. It provides a brief introductory text to FRA, linked to the FRA main website where all our publications are available and displays the logos of our key partners. The landing page also provides the users with different ways, ways to access the data. You can either select a geographical area from the top menu of the page or dive directly into global, regional, or national level info. Let us start by using the top menu and selecting the global results. That will take us to a page 
which provides you with visualization and download functionalities. On the right-hand part, you can see the global results visualized for some of the key attributes. This is the top of the page, and by scrolling down, you will also see the rest of it. Now let's go back to the top. Here you can access the global results in a number of different ways. If you are interested only in the key summary statistics, you can click the spreadsheet icon next to the word global and download the global fact sheet in a non-proprietary open document spreadsheet format. This file you can then use for your further analysis in your favorite software. However, if you are interested in a specific variable and a country or set of countries, you can use the FRA reporting table dialog in the left part of the view. Here, you can select a specific thematic area, a reporting table, and a country or countries, variable, and reporting year or years. Let's see how that looks like. Now, I have randomly selected country Norway, variable forest area, and year 1990. Now I'm adding the year 2000 and 2010. As you can see, the table on the bottom of the screen continues to grow as years are added. And this is how it looks like if I select all the years. As, as you can see, the table on the bottom still has only one row, as so far we have focused on Norway. However, if I select all the countries, this is what I will get. Now, the point of this functionality is, of course, not only to visualize the numbers. We also want you to be able to use them in your own analysis. And that is why we have added the CSV download button, which, as the name suggests, will allow you to download the selected data as comma-separated file, which you can then again, import to your favorite statistical software for your own analysis. But again, this may not be enough for you. After all, so far we have been working with only one attribute and you may actually be interested in a multivariate analysis of some kind. For those of you that belong to that group of people, we have a functionality that allows you to download all the data reported to FRA at once. That is called the bulk download. The bulk download will produce a compressed archive and save it on your computer. I'm not going into the details on how to use these files, but please start by opening the readme.txt that explains what the files contain. Now, just to repeat before we move on, by accessing the global results, you can download a summary fact sheet data for individual variables, or all the data as bulk download. The summary fact sheet and the access to individual variables uh, are also available for the regions. But let's see how to select an individual country and look at the details of their reports. The first thing you need to do is to return to the top menu and select the country you want to access. Let's use Honduras as an example. By selecting the country, you will see a similar view as you saw when selecting the global dataset. However, the difference is that now the menu on the left gives you access to all the data and metadata the country or territory has reported to FRA. In this example, I'm selecting again the first section of the report and the table 1A, extent of forest and other wooded land. By doing so, I can visualize the trend of these two variables, as well as a table with their values together with other land and total land areas. Now, when you look at the graph and the table below, you can see that they use different icons and fonts for different years. Let's see what that means. When hovering over the year displayed in turquoise color, you will see a message that says, click on the year to access original data. And when doing so, you can actually visualize the metadata the country reported for this particular year. That includes reference year, data sources, 
national classification and definitions, as well as a table which explains how the data collected using national definitions were converted to correspond to the FRA reporting classes. As you know, we use global definitions in FRA. However, as this national data point approach is not suitable for all the countries and variables, we have used a hybrid approach, which allows us uh, displaying this data also in a more traditional way, as is the case here for the biomass stock table. In such a case, the metadata are simply displayed on the top of the reporting tables. Finally, if you want to print all this information for offline use, you can select one of the icons on the top to generate an HTML version of the reporting tables or the full report and print it into a PDF or a paper or on paper, depending on your personal preferences. Now, just to recap, by accessing the global or regional results, you can visualize and download data for individual variables. By accessing the results for individual country, you can visualize and download all the data and metadata reported by the country to the FRA process. Dear colleagues, I hope that this demonstration managed to give you an idea how the FRA platform works and gives you a fully transparent access to the data countries and territories have reported to the process. To further explore the platform's functionalities and of course the FRA 2020 data, please, please visit fra-data.fra.org. Please do also send us feedback and suggestions for improvements uh, for the platform by emailing to fra at FAO and let, please let me conclude by thanking all the national correspondents, international experts and institutions for their val invaluable contributions to the FRA process. Special thanks go to the European Union, Global Environment Facility and the governments of Norway and Finland for their financial support that has made these improvements possible. Thank you and back to you, Emily. Thanks a lot, Ansi. That for highlighting the new forest data, an amazing resource. Um, and also for demoing how the platform can be used to access them. That's really great to see. I just wanted to quickly remind everyone, um, if you have any questions for ANSI or any of our speakers, please put them in the Q&A box. I see some of you already started doing that. That's great. Um, ANSI's also reminded us how important it is to have a national forest monitoring system in place for national and international reporting, including to the FRA. Um, and on the subject of new forest data, our next speaker is Ellen Briselius Backer, Policy Director at Norway's International Climate and Forest Initiative. Ellen, great to have you here with us today. Over to you. Thank you, Emily. Um, can you hear me well and see me? Yes, both. And most importantly, see the presentation? Also that. Thank you. So um, good morning, good afternoon or good day to you all, depending on where you are. Greetings from a rainy and grey November Oslo. Um, I'm very glad to be here today to speak to you um, of our recent procurement. Uh, as Emily said, my name is Ellen Briselius Backer. I am the Policy Director for Environmental Integrity <coughs> at Norway's International Climate and Forest Initiative in the Norwegian Ministry of Climate Change and Environment. As I'm sure you all know, Norway has been engaged um, in reducing tropical or deforestation and forest degradation in tropical countries for more than a decade. Uh, we um, are partnering with forest countries, with um, civil society, both local, um, regional, global, to advance this agenda. Um, and I'm very proud to be here today to talk about our recent procurement. Ooh. Right. Um, now, our target is um, to uh, reduce and reverse loss of tropical forests, um, to contribute to a stable climate, protect biodiversity and enhance sustainable development. Now, that is quite a broad sweeping targets. So in order to achieve that, we have several sub-targets, one of which relates to transparency. So we're also working for increased transparency in land management, land use, value chains and financing. Our experience is that um, information and data 
about the tropical forest and what happened to the tropical forest is not always easily available. That is a challenge for uh, forest countries, uh, first country governments, for those who live there, for, for private sector, for, for indigenous people, for, for everybody who cares about the forest and who cares about land use. So through our work um, with the forest countries and all other actors, we realized that um, there was a need uh, for more and more, um, how can I say, reliable uh, access to high resolution uh, satellite imagery for the forest. Uh, this was an understanding that has evolved in our institution as well. Um, so I'm going to talk today a little bit about our intention behind this recent procurement, uh, some key uh, uh, characteristics of the procurement and how we hope that it will be used. So uh, what we really hope is that through this procurement, we will uh, provide a resource that can strengthen forest country governments in their fight to reduce deforestation and forest degradation. This is um, a tool or a resource that we wish to provide to those that really are in charge of, of the forests and the land management. We believe um, that having these data as an open uh, a tool, an open resource that's available to everybody will enhance um, the discussions about forests, the understanding of what's happening to the forest and why it's happening, and enable uh, informed discussions about policies required to uh, reduce deforestation and forest degradation. We're also hoping that through providing it as an open public resource that's available to everyone, everybody, we can unlock innovation and initiative um, and uh, see new and innovative ways of addressing and dealing with uh, tropical deforestation and forest degradation. Right, I'm going to give you a few of the key characteristics of what we've actually procured. Um, so, like I said, this is a public procurement that the Norwegian government has done, but it's not something that we've done for us. It's for everyone out there. So, it's an, um, it's an open resource. We're making it available for everyone. It's not something that we're going to keep, um, keep for us. No, that's not it. Um, it's a procurement of high-resolution satellite data that covers tropical landmasses between 30th, uh, 30th degrees north and 30th degrees, degrees south. Uh, and it also goes a little bit into the sea. I have, I think it's approximately one kilometer, but I need to double check that one um, so that you can also get images of mangrove forests. We thought that was quite important as well. Uh, the images are high resolution in two meanings of the word, uh, both spa spatially, they're less than five meters spatial resolution. And from September 2020 and onwards, we're providing monthly mosaics. So the temporal resolution is also what I would call high resolution. Uh, we're providing it uh, through several channels or through in several ways so that we're trying to hit all users both those that are uh, more experienced with um, satellite imagery and those that are less experienced with satellite imagery so uh, one product that will be available is visual mosaics it will be streamed through several um, different platforms one is global forest watch we're uh, working to um, add more to that one uh, and um, then we also will deliver monthly mosaics, uh, the so-called um, analysis-ready mosaics, also known as the surface reflectance mosaics, for those who wish to do analysis themselves. Now, there is archive imagery as well um, to the contract. It's not just from now going forward. The archive goes back to 2015 and it's uh, two mosaics a year. So not every month for the archive, but twice a year for the archive. Uh, yes, and the duration of the contract, um, it's a contract that's valid for two years with a possible extension of one plus one year. So it, this is a duration of maximum four years. Uh, and we will evaluate um, 
midterm whether there will be an extension of the contract or not. That it really depends on how we see its, its applications and uses, etc. Which brings me to the next slide, which is intended uses. So like I said, we're providing an open resource. It's um, to strengthen forest country governments, but it is also for everybody, for civil society, NGOs, academia, private sector, um, to help us, uh, or not to help us, but to help everybody, for everyone to uh, reduce deforestation and forest degradation. It's quite a wide uh, purpose in the license um, relating to sustainable development, sustainable use of lands. Uh, so I think um, most will find that they fit within that license. Uh, as I mentioned, there are two levels. Um, uh, there are the mosaics that are freely available, there are two levels. One is the visual mosaics, that's level zero. And then we have the level one, which requires uh, a login um, at the planet site that's in blue in the slide there. Um, so if you're interested, I encourage you to go to that planet site, www.planet.com slash nickfee and sign up. Um, it's for free. It's an easy access uh, website. There's nothing required. Um, to, to get access to those data. Uh, and like I said, we're working with the Global Forest Watch and other what we call purpose allies to um, mirror the visual mosaics for those that just want to have a look to see what's happening. So that, that's going to be easily available also through several other channels. Now, um, to be very honest, this is an evolving effort. We haven't done a procurement like this before. Um, I don't think a lot of people have done a procurement of this size when it comes to data and use and applications. So it's a learning process for us too. The contract was entered into a little uh, less than a month and a half ago. So we're currently in the very initial uh, implementation phase which means that we are very open to um, user experiences to know what works, what doesn't work so well, what do we... Ellen, are you still there? Maybe it's just me, but I can't hear you anymore. Same here. Same here. Let me just wait a couple of seconds. And if she doesn't come back, maybe move yeah, on to the next been... presentation. Okay. Sh do you think I should move on, Fabio? Yeah, yeah. you should move on because she's not okay. there anymore. Thanks, Aristide. Okay, um, I think everyone's really excited about NICP's data procurement. Um, it's going to enable a better understanding of forest and land cover change in the tropics, uh, hopefully, and it's really crucial. And I hope everyone listening was, has already signed up to uh, start using these data on the link that Ellen just mentioned and has been put in the chat. Um, really exciting in terms of open data. Our next two presenters are going to show two big data platforms that are essentially built on open data. CPAL is a platform that is open for anyone to use, which enables and facilitates land cover change analyses. Oh, Ellen is back. Ah, hi, Ellen. Sorry, we've, we've moved on. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's Sorry, okay. Sorry, just lost you on the last part of your presentation. Yes, apologies for that. Internet connection is not stable in Oslo. Sorry <laughs> about that. <laughs> um, I Do you will... want to move on or shall I just finish that last slide? Yes, please finish your last slide, maybe. If that's, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Can you see it now? Yes. Okay. So apologies for that. Um, unfortunately, my internet connection does have hiccups. Yes. Yes. So what I was saying is that this is an evolving effort. Um, we are uh, planning outreach. Uh, we're planning webinars. We're planning um, also capacity building to make sure that both people are aware of this data and that you know, um, 
governments, civil society have the capacity to use it, but this is something that also takes a little bit of time for us to organize. Though I will say that the help desk is up and running. It's a 24 seven help desk. So if you try to log in uh, to access the data and you find yourself in trouble, there is help to get. Um, and I'd also just like to take the liberty to encourage you all to, to spread the word, uh, make sure uh, or use the data if you want. And we're very keen to, to learn how uh, the data is helpful and useful. Um, yes, I think um, that's what I wanted to say. Um, so thank you and uh, <laughs> looking forward to hearing from you on your use cases. Thank you. Thanks so much, Alan. Um, so I will. I was just saying before that um, about CPAL, which is a platform which is open for anyone to use, which enables and facilitates land cover change analyses, um, and into which these great data that Ellen has just talked about um, are already available to use. And so with that, I would like to hand over to Elena Feingold, who is a forestry officer at FAO, who is working on developing tools in CPAL for monitoring forest change. Over to you, Elena. Thanks, Emily, and thanks to all the presenters and everyone for, for being here. Um, Ellen, it was really great to hear about uh, more about the NICSI imagery. And I know many people are very eager to access this imagery. And now I'd like to present uh, a platform that we have um, developed at FAO where you can access that newly available high resolution imagery as well as other satellite imagery, the, the CEPL platform. So first, I would like to introduce you to the Open Forest family of tools. Open Forest hosts a set of free and open source tools that are developed by FAO and partners to provide government technicians, civil society, researchers, and individuals the opportunity to monitor land and environment, uh, as well as um, to provide transparent and consistent and reliable methods for reporting data. These tools have supported a wide array of applications, including planning, collecting, and analyzing data for national forest inventories, greenhouse gas emission reporting, monitoring carbon-rich peatlands, and so many more applications. The CEPL platform is part of the open forest set of tools and makes cloud computing, satellite data, and advanced methodologies accessible to any individual interested in geospatial analysis. The objective of CEPL is for anyone to be able to autonomously monitor forest and land using satellite imagery. Our goal is to break barriers with CEPL by, um, and to address the challenges that um, anyone is experiencing accessing or processing satellite data. By accessing and connecting to supercomputers for processing data, we can reduce the time from innovation to adoption of new methodologies. Using CEPL, now it took years or months or weeks uh, to process in processing time can be done in a matter of minutes or seconds. To make this possible, CEPL builds on existing cloud computing technologies and seamlessly integrates tools that can run in Google Earth Engine, R, and Jupyter Notebooks. Now for the exciting part of the presentation, um, I have a, a demo of the CEPL platform. Uh, I encourage everyone to sign up to CEPL. You can do that using this link, cepl.io. And I have two examples to show to you today. First, using a uh, time series analysis and showing the newly available high resolution imagery that you can visualize in CEPL um, and, and how that can be used to monitor forest change. The second example, I'll show how we can generate analysis ready data that can be used for many applications, including land cover monitoring at the national scale. In this demo, 
we'll see how CEPL can be used to analyze satellite data to monitor forest change. To access CEPL, you'll need to start by filling out a simple form to create an account, and anyone can sign up. Inside CEPL, there are a variety of tools, and today we'll, um, and we can't look at all of those tools, but today we'll be um, first focusing on CCDC, a time series analysis tool that's able to ingest thousands of satellite observations and um, assess trends. So first we select our area of interest. We have a forest stand in Bangladesh and Cox's Bazaar here. Then we select the dates that we'd like to do the time series analysis over and the um, imagery as well as the vegetation indices that will be used to detect the seasonal trends and changes. Then we select the area that we would like to run this analysis over. Here, I'll be showing this analysis over a point, but it can be run over a large area, even at the national scale. Here, we can see that we have oops, some decline. Um, we can see that there's some decline in the forest area. This is characterized as forest degradation. And then an increase because there has been replanting here and restoration of this area. Now we can go in and see how this imagery looks in the, in the, in the planet imagery that's now available thanks to this NIC fee procurement. We can see in 2020, it was very green. And then as we go back in time, we can see that this was actually a, a very degraded area. Um, and this area had a, a high risk of landslides and left the population um, vulnerable. So the, it was restored um, around 2018. And this, the, the planet imagery that we have access to, we can also run analytics on it. And we're working on um, providing easy to use tools to process that imagery in CEPL. And we hope that will we'll be available to you soon. So that was the, the first very quick demo that we have in CEPL. And now the next example, I'd like to show how CEPL can be used at the national scale to quickly generate analysis ready da data that can be used for a variety of uh, land monitoring applications and mapping. So again, we're back in CEPL, and now I'd like to take you through how to create a best pixel optical mosaic. It can be, CEPL can be used to generate data anywhere in the world, and today we're zooming in on Bangladesh, but we can do this for anywhere in any, any area of interest. We select the year that we'd like to query the data and the satellite data that we'd like to use. This now just in seconds, I've created a Landsat 8 mosaic for 2020. Such data is essential for land cover and land use mapping, distinguishing forest types, crop mapping, identifying for forest disturbances, such as fires, flooding, and pest outbreaks. With just a few clicks, we can access the archives of Landsat and Sentinel and multiple satellites can be fused together to create the mosaic, which is especially useful in cloudy areas. Powerful algorithms are running here in the background and are used to pre-process the data, and the user is able to control the level and type of processing. Users can save the project and go back later to work on that mosaic by just typing a name here for the, the project that they've created. We can also use radar data, ESA's Sentinel-1 satellite that can see through the clouds. And we can actually combine this radar data with the, the optical data that we've just uh, created in a classification uh, to get improved results. So here we see a time scan of 2020 for, of Sentinel-1 data. We have information over time. Again, we have different pre-processing options that we can turn on or off and select different types of um, pre-processing options to apply to that imagery. We can compare it with um, how that looks in the optical imagery. And we can also zoom in to a specific area. So now we're zooming in on the Sundarbans mangroves in Bangladesh. This is one of the largest remaining mangrove 
forest and is a biodiversity hotspot for both terrestrial and marine ecosystems. This, um, this type of satellite data that's um, of high quality and timely can be used to monitor such areas to prevent and reduce deforestation and forest degradation. We've also used um, this type of data in many applications, including mapping natural disasters. So that was the, the very quick demo that I have of CEPL. Um, and then I'd just also like to say, you can then export that data from the platform uh, and use it on your computer or in any other type of um, data processing platform that we use. So in CEPL, we really, we aim to, to bring the data to the people, to make that data easy to use, to make it accessible. Um, and we do that through open source and transparent tools. And here in this slide, these lines show the thousands of people that are using CEPL around the world. And we have been able to harness innovation and have a massive impact through engagement of our user base. And in line with the enhanced transparency framework, CEPL provides transparent tools to technicians so that the, they then can provide reliable information that can be recorded um, and reported for, um, for national reporting needs, such as Bangladesh is doing, or um, for international reporting, such as uh, FRA, as ANSI presented. And this data can then be uh, displayed once it's finalized in, in platforms such as the Hand in Hand, which we'll hear about soon. So that's all for CEPL. I hope everyone uh, found that interesting. And thanks for your attention. Back to you, Emily. Thanks so much, Elena, for demoing CPAL um, and showing us how user-friendly and easy it is to process and analyze satellite data right now. Um, our next presenter is going to also show us another innovative geospatial big data platform. Carl Morteo is an information technology officer at FAO leading the development of the Hand in Hand geospatial platform. Carl, the floor is yours. Thank you very much and uh, good day to one and all. And let me just uh, share my screen. Just want to confirm that people can see something. Hopefully a big map. Yes, okay. Um, so I'd like to talk to you today a little bit about uh, FAO's hand-in-hand -hand geospatial platform, uh, what it is, uh, why we built it, and uh, why we hope you'll find it useful. So the purpose of the platform is to bring together all dimensions of the agri-food system, and then that will help us to differentiate, target, and then formulate evidence-based strategies. So I'm just starting off uh, on, the, on the main entry page to the system. You'll see we have this uh, nice uh, map of the world and uh, the, the green colors that you're seeing here are a set of data provided by the forestry department. Um, and in particu uh, particular, they're showing where the open forest uh, national uh, pr projects are running. Okay, so this left-hand strip that we call the uh, Data Explorer, this shows us what we have uh, visible and it allows us to, to basically do some basic navigation like making things uh, less or more visible. Okay, so let's dive in and see what data we can find. So I'm gonna start out by uh, first of all, uh, masking Bangladesh, because I'm gonna make uh, Bangladesh the focus of, uh, of the presentation today. So uh, here we see uh, the area of the globe highlighting Bangladesh. I'll remove the, uh, the, the, the project definitions. So we can see here um, basically the, the outline of, of what is of interest. And then I'll go back and start to add some data layers so we can build up a picture about Bangladesh, what's going on there in terms of the agri-food systems. So let's start with some forestry data. So the first thing I'd like to show you is uh, from the National Land, uh, uh, sorry, the National Forest Monitoring System. 
you can see that there are many different countries uh, that uh, have data added to the platform. Today, we're going to focus on Bangladesh. Uh, but one of the important takeaway points from seeing the data here is that this data has been provided uh, by the countries using standards and therefore it has been a relatively easy to add the data to, to the platform. So let's uh, first of all start out with, uh, let's see, what can we pick here? Um, let's just start out with something basic like uh, the tree cover. Okay, that doesn't show so clearly, so I'm going to change the background to white. So what we see now is a layer provided by uh, Bangladesh uh, being displayed in this platform that is federating data from many different sources following standards, and the green areas are showing us tree cover. So one of the nice things about the platform is that we're able to take uh, data from many different sources as long as it's following standards. So we just uh, heard people talking about um, the importance of mangroves and there was some analysis done by, uh, by NASA. So I can add that to the map as well. And so now what we'll see is this area highlighted, uh, which is showing you um, a set of data from NASA. And so I'm very quickly able to put together uh, data from NASA, uh, data from the national authorities. So I'll just remove that and I'll remove that. And in fact, I'm gonna remove this, this mask. We now know where Bangladesh is, for those of you that had any doubts. And uh, let's see some of the other data that's been generated in the country. So we could take a quick look at, um, what was the one that I was looking at earlier that was interesting? I was going to look at the revenue from trees and, um, and forest products. So, okay, so what we see here again is, um, is data coming from the country. If I click, we get uh, the detailed information about uh, that particular uh, data set that's been provided. So in this case, we're looking at the revenue from tree and forest products. Okay, so let me remove that and move on a little bit more. So we've seen uh, some of the data being provided from the a national forest monitoring system. Um, we've also heard this very exciting news about the new uh, planet data being av made available by uh, the Norwegian uh, International Climate and Forest Initiative. And so we uh, have already started that integration. You won't see this public on the website today. It's only available in the preview release, but, but it will be there very shortly. So for example, we can take one of the images, uh, we can add it to the map, uh, we can take another image for a different time period and also add that to the map. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to split the map in two and I'm going to put the one image, which is for the period from June to uh, August 2020 on the left. And then I can quickly on the right hand side, put the image uh, at the end of 2019 to May on the right. And so hopefully you should be able to see some, some differences going on here. Um, and as we zoom in, uh, we can see a bit more of the detail coming from this wonderful data set uh, that's being made uh, available by, by the Norwegians. So let me remove that. Um, so we've included all the different interpretations of the data. So for example, um, the uh, this particular one here, which is uh, the tropics normalized mosaic. I have to be honest, I'm not completely familiar with what that is, um, but I'm hoping uh, some of the other people out there will, will better understand that. Okay, let me remove that. Um, so that's enough about the planet data, other than uh, we are busy uh, making it available. So we have the medium resolution data sets available for the current uh, uh, images. Okay, so let's take a look at a few other aspects of Bangladesh. So one of the important things about the hand-in-hand -hand platform is that we're bringing data together from many different disciplines and many different sources. So what I wanted to do is to show you, for example, we could start out with something very, very crude. So in this case, I'm looking at a, a, a data set that's at a national level, um, but I can, um, I can click on the map uh, and I can see some information that in this case is coming from the FAO uh, statistical database. And we can see the, the population here um, growing in, in Bangladesh. 
So that's another way of looking at data. In this case, it's a national aggregate. So, um, so perhaps we'd like to see something a little bit more detailed. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna zoom in and I'm going to look at some raster-based data. So in this case, it's world pop because we're interested to see where in Bangladesh uh, the, the people are. So let's take a time period. Um, so let's see what happened there. Let's take uh, a different time period. Okay, so again, what we're able to do is to see, so I guess this is Dhaka with a higher uh, population density. So if we click, we can get an idea of that specific pixel in terms of people per kilometer squared. So one feature of Bangladesh is it has a very high population density. And what we're gonna do is we take this data set, which is a time series, as you can see here. And so I can split it into two. On the left-hand side, I'll take an early year. So we'll take, uh, for example, the year 2000. And then on the right-hand side, what I'll do is I'll take a, a late year, like 2020. And so what I hope we should be able to see is the increase in population. I, I hope you can see that out there. Perhaps uh, it's not quite so obvious. In fact, these country boundaries are making it a little bit difficult to so just remove those. So uh, you can see that uh, there is a, a lots of higher density uh, areas uh, around this area. So this is another aspect that's very important when you're considering a country and, and what interventions that you, uh, you're going to be making there and you want to use some evidence. So um, uh, another thing that's important is, for example, access to electricity. So we can use a surrogate for that. So we could take uh, we can take the uh, the the uh, night lights. So this is stable night lights. I'll change um, I'll change the background here to make it a little bit more evident. Um, and uh, uh, again, this is this is a time series. So uh, another way of looking at a time series is just to step through time. So I'm stepping through time and we're moving from 2009 to 2008. And what you'll see is these yellow patches of continuous bright lights at night uh, expanding and contracting. So that gives it another dimension that we could look at. Um, okay, uh, the other thing we could look at, so we don't have time to go through everything, but let's just say, for example, we might want to look at where the, uh, where the, uh, the, the mobile phone access is available in the country. So this is a map showing us where there is good mobile phone coverage as opposed to not so good mobile phone coverage. And again, that could be an important aspect when you're making, making some planning. And then we could uh, enrich that with uh, the submarine cables, bringing in, um, bringing in the internet into Bangladesh and we could take a look at uh, where those those port those uh, those cables that are arriving. So we're slowly building up a picture about the infrastructure uh, with respect to telecommunications. So I'll move on very quickly here and just do a little bit on transport. So what we could do is we can take a look at, for example, where the airports are. So we might be interested in shipping out agricultural high value products. And so we could then look at maybe also the medium sized airports. And now perhaps we wanna see how they're connected. So we could say, okay, let's take a look at the railroads. So we can put in the, the railroads on top uh, and see them being connected here. Um, and uh, as we build up a picture, uh, you, 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 you get an idea of the transport infrastructure within the country. So let me remove the railroads for a minute, and then I can put on, for example, the, uh, the, the, the road network. So let's put, the, this is from OpenStreetMap. So we can put on the road, the road map, and I can uh, zoom in uh, a little more. And, and this time I want to show some high resolution uh, satellite imagery. So this is a one shot. So it's not like the, the data that we just saw recently um, from, um, from uh, the planet um, in, in, that, uh, in that this is a one shot, it's a, it's a composite, it's a very high resolution image. Uh, but in, on occasion, this can be very useful for betting and better understanding what's going on um, at the very, very detailed level. So here we can get right down to individual street names um, and buildings. Um, so that's another way of looking at, um, at a country uh, and making some kind of analysis. 
So let me remove all that and in the interest of time, uh, zoom in a little bit further. So I'm not gonna show anything else in this section now. Um, well, perhaps while we were on transport, we could take a look at the port infrastructure. So we could look at uh, the imports. Let's take a look at the imports of grains and oils. So um, I'm just loading uh, this data set here, which is uh, showing us where the, uh, the shipping is. Let me just turn to the map so you can see it a little bit more clearly. Um, and I'm gonna zoom out a little bit here so that I believe there's a port along here. So as I, um, as I skip through, we'll see there's a port over here. So this is the port of Chatogram and we can see the shipments coming in and out of that port. And this particular one was uh, one for raw sugar. Um, so it gives us another dimension of what's going on in the country. Okay, um, let me remove that um, and take a look at something else on the, on the general sort of trade topic. We could take a look at some of the price data. So the big data lab in FAO is, um, is looking at uh, analytics to get an idea of the volatility of prices. So if we were to take a look at, for example, I'm guessing bread, could be interesting or well, I'll just say with, with apples for now. So um, what we've got here is a quick price volatility map um, and we can see some of the latest prices and um, I guess this is the impact of COVID and then the price is coming back down and stabilizing to a previous uh, normal standard. So we can see in the current period we have this delta variation of uh, minus 198 um, uh, 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 currency values. Okay, so um, let me remove that and uh, see what else we could very quickly look at while we're here. We could also look at the farmer market prices. So this is the food price monitoring system, uh, which is also active if, um, in, no, so that's India. So, so much for my geography, maybe I should actually put the, uh, the, the boundaries back on so I know what I'm doing. Okay, that's a bit better. So uh, let's uh, skip to, um, let's see, uh, if we take um, flour and uh, so we're looking at Carl? markets. Yes. Sorry, if I may, um, we've only got less than 15 minutes left. So if I could just maybe stop you there, sorry. Sure. Yeah, sorry, <laughs> it, I've been going a little bit too long. It's incredibly interesting. It seems like, yeah, you just, there's so much that you, yeah. it's sort of sorry, like- Sorry, I'd, I'd lost track of time there, sorry. No, no, that's, it's absolutely amazing and really inspiring to see an amazing resource. Fantastic. Um, uh, let me move on to some questions, though, I think maybe. Um, let me see. Okay. Um, thank you to you and to all the presenters for showing us the new data and the new ways of accessing and sharing and utilizing data and information. Um, I'm going to if anyone, I've seen there's a lot of questions in the Q&A box, please keep adding them. Um, I'm going to start asking questions now first to, to Mariam, um, just in chrono the chronological order in which the presentations were. So my first is to Mariam, um, and it's also relating to the question from Kai Kim Chang and uh, Jose Armando Alanis de la Rosa. I think Mariam, you already started responding to these, but the question is about what made Bangladesh move towards open data? What was the process to bring that about and what were the challenges faced? Thank you, Emily. Uh, this is a very common question for us. Actually, we are answering many of the times because we, as I explained in my slides already, that uh, it's, there is very much like, we have lacks of IT skills and facilities in the forest department and we, do not have adequate uh, human resources to manage and maintain those uh, information systems as well as hardware, software, and everything. So we did a service level agreement with the Bangladesh Computer Councils. And then really we are uh, now, it's easy for us to maintain those things. And then uh, we, uh, at Forest Department, we are building our capacities. And at the same time, we are taking support uh, currently uh, World Bank uh, is supporting us to develop this system. Previously, we took support from FAO and uh, 
USAID and several other organizations, really, they are supporting us and we are planning. We are grateful that we are preparing data to make available to all the stakeholders and so that we would be transparent in data sharing and consistent report we can prepare and that we, which will help us to address the management issues and monitoring our uh, forests. Is it okay, Emily, with you? It's perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Mariam, very much. Um, so having just heard from, from um, Mariam there, the next question then is to Ansi. Um, Ansi, how does the FRA take on feedback from countries such as Bangladesh in the FRA reporting processes to ensure that you're staying up to date and responsive to needs and the voices of stakeholders? Um, that's one question, and I think it might relate to there's a lot of questions for you on the Q&A box. It might relate to the one about the user um, statistics from, from Romi. How is that being tracked? Um, and also a question from Ibrahim. Ibrahim. Who provides the state the data? Is it the states? So um, over to you, Nancy. OK, thanks. Thanks, Emily. What comes to the fraud process and feedback from the countries and other stakeholders, I can just say that we are all ears. The global uh, forest resources assessment is essentially a country driven process. And we are actually conducting the whole thing at the country's request. And during the data collection, the fraud secretary works very closely with the national focal points, national correspondents, as we call them, who are responsible for compiling the report for their countries and territories. These national correspondents report their official country statistics to the, uh, to the FRA process, and I guess this is also responding to the question that Ibrahim presented in, in the QA. The role of the FRA secretariat is to help the national correspondents to interpret the FRA terms and definitions, to help them to understand the reporting methodology and to solve any issues they may have with their national figures, potentially coming from different inventories or mapping exercises using different methodologies. Now, the FRA reports, and this is also partially, I think, replying to some other questions, um, the FRA reports have been published every five years. And that has been an issue for some other stakeholders that wish to have more frequent uh, updates on the information on, on key FRA attributes. At the same time, this reporting frequency has sometimes limited our ability to publish the latest national information. This could happen in cases where the new data were not ready in the country to be shared when FRA needed to have it because of the timeline of our report production process. As you can imagine, that takes quite some time. Um, and this has, of course, been frustrating for the countries and for us as FRA, because our ultimate objective is to allow the countries to highlight their latest data through the FRA. Now, the uh, FAO Forestry's work is guided by the Committee on Forestry, which is a biennial gathering of uh, the highest forestry authorities in the countries and they provide feedback on our past work and guidance for our future work. And now I have some good news for those of you who would like to see those more frequent updates because while the latest Committee on Forestry requested FAO to continue publishing the full FRA report every five years, this comprehensive analysis that I mentioned in my presentation, uh, they also requested FAO to develop a more flexible FRA reporting process that allows voluntary updates of key indicators as new information allows. And that means that the countries in the future, hopefully, will actually be able to provide more frequent updates and share those updates through the FRA process. That also links to the question about the fires. This, of course, will be a very challenging task for us, and we need to be very careful when moving to that direction to make sure that we don't break the consistency of the FRA database and we do not increase the reporting burden on countries. But uh, I do believe that having this mandate now, within the next years, we will be able to accommodate new data and share them as soon as the countries are ready to report them to FAO. Naturally, the FRA platform that I presented will play a huge role in that, as it will uh, reduce the reporting burden and the time needed for the, the reporting, reviewing, analyzing, and publishing of the submitted data. And one more thing regarding the question about the geospatial layers. Currently, the FRA platform dissemination functionalities are limited to tabular data and narrative uh, type of description uh, in the metadata sections. But we hope that in the future, well, of course, already currently, we encourage the countries to share links in their report 
to their national geospatial data sets. And in the future, hopefully, we will be also able to be more proactive in sharing uh, the national data sets that the countries wish to share. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ansi. Um, next question goes to Alan. Uh, there's a question also from uh, Jose Armando. It's, what do you hope to see the data being used for? Yes, uh, thank you for that question. It's a very, very important question and a good question. I think, um, obviously, our hope is that will be the data will be used um, for uh, designing policies that reduce deforestation and forest degradation uh, and measure the effects of such policies. That's really the um, overall intent of the procurement and indeed of the efforts of, of Norway's International Climate and Forest Initiative. Now, that being said, uh, on the more practical applications, which perhaps I think is, is also part of the question, is, uh, to be honest, I think it's fair to say that each country knows best itself what it, what it can use these data for. Um, so, I'm not in a position to prescribe uh, uses to any country, but of the things that we are in thought um, the data could be used for is obviously to, obviously to reduce the uncertainty um, of data. It could be used as training data. Uh, we were hoping that it would also enable countries to better estimate forest degradation, knowing that that's quite hard um, with, uh, with more coarse resolution. We uh, were also thinking that perhaps it could be useful for restoration efforts um, with high resolution. And perhaps also it could be a tool to um, fight forest crime, given the high temporal resolution. So these are some key words that we've um, had in mind, but I think also uh, all the forest countries and other users out there uh, are those best positioned to know the use um, of these data. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Ellen. That was really clear. Um, next question goes now to Yelena. Sorry to run through all these really fast. Um, the question to you, Yelena, is um, CPILE and other tools, how do they enable transparency on the analytical methods used to transform data into information, into results? So, for example, a country reports that they use CPILE to estimate area of deforestation and presents the end results. Um, but how can transparency regarding those methods be achieved? Thanks, Emily. That, that's a really great question. And um, I was only able to show uh, a few ways that we use CEPL, how we can access data, but we can also further um, create maps, analyze that data. And we have um, an application in CEPL for assessing the, the accuracy and, um, and the uncertainty and uh, producing area estimates from maps, um, combining sample information and map information um, in order to provide estimates that can be reported on. Um, and um, in terms of the, the methodology, CEPL and open forest tools, they're all open source. So that means that the code um, that allows the user to execute the tools. They're all available online uh, through the Open Forest GitHub. And we encourage open collaboration and exchange. Um, we have an Open Forest community support forum. Um, and that's an online forum which allows users to share posts about how they think, um, about how they're using the tools, about questions that they have about using those tools, errors they encounter, and improvements that they would like to see. Um, and the methods that um, are used in CEPL and in open forest tools, they are all based on um, peer reviewed science. So that provides um, substantial background material for users um, to better understand the methodology. And we also have user manuals and tool documentation to transparently provide um, background information and practical information needed to, um, to use these tools. So those are just some of the ways that, um, that those tools are transparent. Um, these tools av available in CEPL allow the transformation of raw satellite data 
um, and using replicable methods into information that then can be used for reporting. Um, SIPL provides customization and flexibility and gives ownership to the end user, which is very important and allows them to integrate their own data and combine it with that satellite data, um, the user input data might be field data or high resolution um, data that's been um, or some sample information that's been interpreted from high resolution data and to build data and information that reflect the user's environments and national circumstances. And many countries have been using open forest tools um, for reporting to international conventions. We have uh, forest reference levels. We have about 60% of the um, forest reference level submissions have actually used open forest tools, which um, we've been really proud to, to support those countries. And an increasing amount of countries are also providing transparent documentation online of the methods and tools that they're using in order to generate uh, that data through standard operating procedures. And there's also international and global guidance, such as GFOI's uh, methods and guidance document that provide information about how to use these tools for reporting. So yeah, that, that's how um, anyone can use these tools for, for transparent uh, reporting. Back to you, Emily. Thanks a lot, Yelena. I al always find it really encouraging to know that there's a human community behind the user interface that are there to help you, help all the users here listening of all these great tools and data that can respond to your questions and can um, help improve and collaborate. I find that really inspiring. So my final question is to Carl. Um, it also relates to a question that's been put in the Q&A box. Uh, what new and upcoming data sets and potentially countries um, do you plan on incorporating next into the Hand in Hand platform? Um, and finally, what is the idea behind developing the Hand in Hand platform right now? Over to you, Carl. Thank you very much. Okay, so in, in terms of the coverage of the countries, um, whenever possible, we are including global data sets. Uh, we have a priority list of countries that are part of the uh, Food and Agriculture Organization's Hand in Hand initiative. So presently, I believe that there are 39 confirmed countries uh, and that will be growing over the coming, uh, the coming months. So that's uh, how we're prioritizing which countries uh, are join, join the platform. Uh, in the hand-in-hand -hand countries, uh, there are also teams that are working to uh, help to provide the data, to correct the data and to give us guidance. Uh, and that comes a little bit to what data and when. So there's a lot of data out there. Not all of it is relevant. Not all of it is the right quality. So we're basically driven by uh, the process of understanding uh, the efficiency and efficacy of the agricultural value chains. So uh, the objective of the Hand in Hand uh, project is to improve the lives of, uh, of the people in the countries. And therefore we look to the guidance to, from the analysts, the, the, uh, which data is required for them to be able to provide this assessment. So in short, uh, we're, we're adding data based on the priority of the country and its match to the requirements for this analysis that helps to target and formulate policy. Uh, so I hope that gives you an idea of the, uh, in terms of the concrete data that's being added, um, right now we're currently working on some more detailed soil data than we currently have that's required for some of the agricultural planning and, um, and uh, many subnational data sets. Uh, especially based on surveys that have been carried out in countries. Uh, in terms of why we're doing it, uh, originally it was uh, intended uh, for this specific purpose of the hand-in-hand -hand platform, uh, but what we've discovered is that having uh, a lot of data from different sources available in one place uh, has become very useful for other tasks, for it epidemiology or uh, for, for many other spin-off tasks that we didn't originally foresee. Um, so uh, it's become part of our stable uh, uh, future plan to have a single platform uniting the data. 
Fantastic. Thank you, Carl. Um, and thanks to all of the presenters today, Rocio, Mariam, Nancy, Ellen, Carl and Elena. I think we managed to pack a lot into the last hour um, and hopefully inspired some of you to, some of you listening to explore some of the platforms and data that are out there now. Um, thank you, of course, all to all of you that participated today. We really appreciated it and um, hope that this has been, this webinar has been of interest and of help to you. Um, I've noticed there are still a lot of questions in the Q&A box. Thank you so much for the engagement there. Hopefully we've managed to answer most of them, but fear not if your question hasn't been answered, we will be getting around to all questions in a follow-up email along with the recording and uh, PowerPoint presentations as soon as we can. Um, let me briefly pass back to Christina, who will tell us about upcoming courses and other materials you may be interested in before closing with um, Julian's closing remarks. Over to you, Christina. Sorry, I can't hear you too well, Christina. The list of course, yeah, excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much. As, as Emily was mentioning, uh, the recording, uh, as well as all the materials, the PowerPoint and the answers to all your question will be made available through the FL eLearning Academy. So um, in addition, we have prepared here a list of uh, relevant forestry related uh, e-learning courses that are available through the Academy. So we invite you all to have a look. So we have a, a course on forest uh, and transparency under the Paris Agreement. We also have uh, a course on the SDG indicator uh, related to forestry, also uh, climate smart forestry, uh, and um, a, a, as well as, uh, of course, um, national socioeconomic surveys in forestry, the measurement uh, of, um, and the role of forests and trees in household. Uh, welfare and uh, livelihoods, and, and uh, the, the list is, uh, is just here uh, presented. I would like to uh, therefore invite you all to have a, uh, to have a look and to visit the, the FAO eLearning Academy. And I'd like to take this uh, opportunity to mention that this uh, webinar was actually extremely rich and dense. So I would like to thank very much all the presenters. I would like to thank our partners in this initiative, which are UNSCAP and Agrinium. Um, the people behind the scenes, Fabio Picinic and um, Aristide Bucare, and of course, all of you, the participants. Thank you all very much. I'd like to pass the floor now to Ansi. Um, sorry, passing to Julian for the closing remarks. Thanks a lot, Christina, so much. Um, over to you, Julian. Julian is a senior forestry officer and the team leader of National Forest Monitoring at FAO. He's going to give us the closing remarks. Thank you. Thank you so much to our presenters and the audience for the active engagement. Uh, I'll revisit some of the key emerging themes from today's seminar very briefly because we are over time. But all presentations had the consistent theme of using innovation and technology for creating open and transparent forest data. Rossio started off uh, identifying the key role of national forest monitoring systems as a foundation for transparent, reliable, relevant, accessible and sustainable forest data for national decision making and for the enhanced transparency framework of the Paris Agreement. Mariam presented an example of an operational national forest monitoring system in Bangladesh, the Bangladesh Forest Information System, a fully transparent system that makes high quality forest data accessible to both national and international stakeholders through a web portal. Congratulations to the Forest Department who have worked closely with the FAO representation in Bangladesh over several years and across several projects to achieve this. And more details can be found in the case study launched today. ANSI presented FAO's Global Forest Resource Assessment, the authoritative source of forest data for 75 years, which for the first time has become available through an innovative, open and transparent online platform. Alan presented the global good contribution from Norway's International Climate and Forest Initiative for open high resolution imagery for the tropics to support efforts to stop the destruction of the world's rainforests. Yelena presented CEPAL, FAO's, FAO's open and transparent geospatial platform with over 5,000 users creating their own geospatial information for forests and land use. And finally, Carl presented FAO's corporate geospatial platform, the hand in hand, which integrates data and information across FAO domains, agriculture, forestry, fisheries, this is powerful because agriculture and forestry need to be considered together when making land management decisions. The hand in hand is also great for data visualization, 
and it's so exciting to see its use for visualizing national forest monitoring system data from countries and in the future, the new high resolution imagery from NICFI. So thank you so much to the panelists, our moderator, Emily, and to the eLearning Academy for enabling today's webinar and big thanks to you at peak over 250 participants for joining us. It clearly demonstrates the high interest in this topic and encourages us to keep driving forward at full speed. In summary, today we have heard how innovation and technology can support open and transparent forest data. We encourage you all to access and use the innovative platforms and the new data presented today for collective action toward protecting, conserving and restoring forests for the climate and for the world. Thank you very much for your valuable time. Have a great Wednesday and a great week. Signing off from Rome.